today is no longer sufficient to say we are compliant. It doesn't mean anything, you know, because you have obligations and implicit contracts with your, you know, stakeholders, right? So you want to make sure that companies want to sort of do business with other companies whose values align with theirs, right? It's no longer compliance is no longer the standard. Employees want to work at companies where, you know, sort of values align with theirs. ESG has exploded into compliance and business consciousness in 2021. Join Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, on the ESG Report and learn about sustainability risks, opportunities, and issues that business leaders and compliance professionals need to know about regarding ESG. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode. And today we have double the fun because I have Jag Lambda and Daniel Perry with me. And they're going to talk about a really interesting innovation that they have jointly put together around third-party risk management. As you guys might know, the vast majority of my listeners are in the compliance space and different forms of compliance, AML, ABC, export control, cyber, data, you name it. But the one common denominator in that entire universe of listeners is third parties third-party risk management. So when I saw the information on what you guys have put together, I was was actually pretty excited to have you guys on. So with that, could you guys tell us, number one, your professional backgrounds, and number two, what companies you're with and what your role is in those companies today? And Jack, could I start with you? Happy to, Tom. Thanks for having me. My background is, you know, started as an engineer, joined McKinsey Consulting for many years, did some VC investing and then, you know, started this company called Serda. So Serda is a end-to-end third-party lifecycle management platform, Tom. Your listeners might understand what we do, but you know, many, many audiences just don't get it. But third-party lifecycle management involves, you know, everything from onboarding to, you know, all the AML sort of, you know, checks to FCPA checks and et cetera. We do this for some of the largest firms, you know, Fortune 10 firms to some of the large tech companies. And recently, what we've been hearing is a lot about ESG, and that's what brings us to a relationship with Daniel. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So my background is in procurement technology, e-procurement solutions. And then I joined Ecovatis in 2015. And Ecovatis is a network of sustainability ratings. So we provide the platform and technology to support that network. And we also have a whole other side of the business, which is the sustainability ratings themselves. So we have the analysts, document collectors, validators, and so forth to actually assess the sustainability of businesses of any size in any country, any industry. So, Jack, if I could ask you a little bit about Asserta and the the products and services, because I think we're at a point now that third-party risk management and a third-party automated platform to help in the overall life cycle of that management, not simply a nice to have anymore. I think it's almost table stakes. and That's probably your view as well. But really, why do you think the automation of third parties is so critical coming out of the pandemic and as we look into 2025 and even beyond? A few reasons, right, Tom. Firstly, companies are not islands. Companies exist mainly with the help of, you know, obviously your partners and vendors, et cetera, right? That network keeps growing as the company grows. But generally, even for the same size of company, what we've noticed in the last five years is that the third party network is expanding. It's driven largely by globalization, but also a lot of the new changes related to like digital transformations, right? Now, with this, you're sharing a lot more sensitive data. Your reputations are intertwined because of social media, et cetera. The regulatory pressure exists, has always existed, you know, over the last like at least 15 years for FCPA, et cetera, right? FCPA, AMLs, you know, all the compliance. When you add sort of just a logistical nightmare of sort of, you know, managing thousands of third parties, plus the compliance burden, plus the data security, data privacy burden, and now the ESG burden, of managing these third parties. There's just no way companies can manage this without automation. The challenge a lot of my clients face is they have 
too many tools to automate this. So that's why one of the things about Serda is that it basically can create a nice, easy to use layer over your existing tools, connecting all the existing tools into one easy to use lifecycle management across all the risk domains. When you gave some of your opening remarks, Jag, about reasons for third-party risk management, you ticked off uh, laws such as Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. You also mentioned AML, data privacy, data protection. But one of the things that intrigued me about your approach seems to be that, yes, legal compliance is important, but the real danger is reputational damage. And in the age of social media where voices Mm -hmm. are amplified, I was trying to think of an example, and of course, we had one this morning where Phil Mickelson is no longer a spokesman for KPMG. So I was wondering if you could really help the compliance practitioner not so much understand reputational damage, because I think they understand that, but when you counsel clients or potential clients, why do you explain to them that reputational damage is damage to your brand through your third parties can be one of the biggest risks and the biggest risks to your bottom line as well? The reputational part is an implicit contract that we make with all our key stakeholders as companies. So with our clients, with our employees, with our investors, and obviously with you know our suppliers and partners as well. So there is this sometimes with everyone implicit contracts, but sometimes explicit contracts that we make with like, you know, with all our stakeholders, right? And any reputational issue is a breach of that contract. So you want to hold your third parties to that same standard. So, you know, Tom, today, it's no longer sufficient to say we're compliant. It doesn't mean anything, you know, because you have obligations and implicit contracts with your, you know, stakeholders, right? So you want to make sure that companies want to sort of do business with other companies whose values align with theirs, right? It's no longer compliance is no longer the standard. Employees want to work at companies where you know, sort of values aligned with theirs. And over the last few years, we've just seen enterprise value decimated, employee attrition, when you're sort of, you know, not living those values. And literally with the amount of dependency on third parties now, you're sort of bearing that risk. The whole compliance sort of rule that, yeah, you can outsource work, but you can't, you know, you still bear the burden of all the regulation. The same thing applies to reputation as well. Yes, you can outsource work, but you are responsible for who you outsource that work to. It's all on you. So I just think that the standard has risen now, Tom. It's no longer compliance. It's much beyond data security privacy. It's about whether my values align with this company or not. Well, if I could turn to you, your work at Ecovatus and the company's products and services themselves, there's probably very few more ubiquitous phrases right now in the corporate world in ESG. So with that, if I could maybe ask, how does Ecovatus really help a corporation and specifically name the sustainability wrong, but how can a company improve their sustainability transition from your perspective? One of the big challenges you mentioned is sustainability. ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance. The S standing for social And sustainability is actually an all-encompassing that covers all of the three pillars of ESG and then some. What we've seen is that the demand for capacity on managing ESG risks is moving at a faster rate than maturity. So new employees going into the workplaces are expecting to see full ESG reporting, mission statements, purpose statements from their CEOs on what the company is about, where they stand on certain topics and issues, what they're doing, what action they're taking. And a lot of the time, that's just not there. And so while in the US, especially in North America, more broadly, we see change because of failure to act or, in Mickelson's example, maybe misspoke or ill intent or or what have you. In Europe, we're seeing regulation being one of the key drivers for for moving this market. And with this European regulation, because they're starting to get down to smaller and smaller sized businesses needing to take action, it's affecting US-based multinational companies because with the new EU proposal, for example, on requiring businesses to protect human rights and the environment and value chains, 
that can impact eventually companies with as little as 250 employees or doing $40 million worth of business in any given European country. So that's going to impact a lot of US businesses. And when they're looking at compliance, it's much easier to roll out a program that's one rule for all than a hodgepodge of rules and regulations for suppliers and their value chain in different regions. So much like with GDPR, was there a need for GDPR in North America because of scandal? Yes, there was, because there was the Cambridge Analytica showed that North America was in desperate need for better management of personal data. But there was also Europe working on regulation at the same time. And so what ended up happening is the world just sort of aligned with that because it's much easier for everybody to just follow the one set of rules. So how does Ecovatus help? When looking at the procurement side or the contract management or lifecycle management, you need experts on your team even just to decide what to buy or what service to procure. Sometimes you might outsource that, but generally you're going to have some folks on your team who are expert at procuring the sorts of things that you need to be able to run your business. Are they also going to be experts on sustainability, ESG, and so forth? Probably not. They're going to know what bolts and widgets and things are needed, but they're not going to be an expert on where have these materials been sourced from and is that good or bad or otherwise. So what Ecovatus provides is a simple scorecard that can tell you whether a company is doing well or doing poorly on key areas of sustainability, environment, labor and human rights, ethics, and supply chain. And what you can do with those scorecards is because it's harmonized outputs for all of your suppliers, you can zoom out and start making broad tactical decisions. So is this category manager doing a good job of selecting sustainable suppliers, yes or no? You can make those kinds of calls. If you need to roll down incentive programs, if the CEO is being told he's going to be remunerated based on the carbon footprint of his company, then by rights, the chief procurement officer is going to be remunerated based on the carbon footprint of the supply chain, which means that the category managers need to also be incentivized under similar rules. So by having one way to understand the ESG of all of your suppliers, you're able to implement those types of changes. Daniel, why is the sustainability ratings so crucial now? And from where I sit, it's going to become even more crucial down the road for companies, for investors, for stakeholders, and basically everyone else. I think where sustainability ratings really got started is in the investment space. And there's a certain profile of investor who is interested in having a guilt-free investment where they know their money is not going towards arms or tobacco or towards big carbon emitting companies and, and so forth. So they were looking for a way that they could compare and contrast a shoe factory from a car manufacturer from a bank. And so this idea of a sustainability rating came about. The problem and with the way they had been produced to date is that it's predominantly based on publicly available information and requires a team of analysts to do detective work on publicly available information. So you're scraping websites and looking for those incidents that might prove to the contrary. So you might have a car manufacturer whose public statements are all perfect, all of their sustainability reports are perfect, but there's maybe some scandal that's come out about them cheating on their emissions calculations and and so forth. And so that's going to get picked up and then it rolls into an ESG rating. You don't have that luxury of that amount of data when you're looking at a supplier on the other side of the world that's mainly only manufacturing one type of component that's only been in existence for about three years and doesn't speak your language and doesn't have a website. So the need came about for company like ours to be able to, at scale, engage directly with these businesses, assess them on what's relevant to them, a way that can be validated, and come out with you know something that's uniform and understandable and actionable. So gentlemen, I'd like to now turn to the partnership, if I can use that word, that both CERTA and Equibatis have entered into and ask you, what does this integration mean for not only your companies, but also for 
the consuming public, both in third-party risk management and in the greater ESG world. And, and Jack, could you start off with that one? What it means for our clients, most importantly, is that CERDA's clients can get a single place to mitigate sort of requirements and needs around AML, FCPA, data security, data privacy, and ESG, all in one place. So CERDA's approach has been sort of, you know, very open in the way that we integrate with about 100 data sources. And with adding Ecovares, which is, you know, one of the premier sustainability rating services, our clients can, you know, sort of just almost with drag and drop, add Ecovares ratings for their third parties, in addition to sort of all the other things that we provided. So I think our goal is to make all this compliance, all these sort of aspirations and goals that companies have around the ESG and other sort of, you know, ethics and compliance areas much easier to do. For me, this partnership allows clients to do that much more easily for, as it relates to ESG uh, sort of regulations and goals. You know, from Ecobatis' perspective, we want to be where critical decisions are being made. So we want our data in the hands of those that need it. And whether it's a compliance professional or an investment professional or a procurement professional or what have you, we want to make sure that that rich data that we can provide is available in their tools that they don't have to stop what they're doing and go off to an entirely different system and break from their day-to-day operations. I really like the three phrases you use, compliance professional, investment professional, and procurement professional, because that to me encapsulates the broadness, the breadth and scope of sustainability and ESG right now. And that really, I wanted to ask you, Daniel, how does the Ecovatis sustainability ratings or how will they be integrated directly into the supplier lifecycle management flow? It really will boil down to the appetite of the customer, how critical ESG is to their compliance program. It could be that it really is a barrier to entry. No rating, we're not doing business. And so there could be triggers in place in that workflow to ensure that either you know, the onboarding of the supplier is rejected outright, or B, it triggers a request for that supplier to go and get rated. And then the tracking of the progress of that supplier going through the rating process is completely you know, transparent and visible to the compliance professional. It could be that there's other mitigating factors, like if we want to have a contract with them that's over a certain period of time or something like that, then they need to have a rating and, and so forth. And that's all about just getting the rating. More mature customers may be looking at the actual scores. And so we have some customers who are looking at the number. So we have scores out of 100 overall or even on themes. And they may say, well, if they are below 40 out of 100 and they're within this geographic region and they're within this particular category of spend, then the risk is too high and we do not want to do business with them. So it generates an automatic message back to that supplier to say, nice try, please go away and do better and then we'll be ready to do business with you. Just to build on what Daniel said, right? So Ecovaris can provide the ratings. Now, all the business rules around what you do with the ratings is what CERDA can automate for companies. So CERDA can, you know, set these thresholds per region, per spend amount, per commodity and say, okay, well, these are my rules and let's put them on autopilot. And that's what the partnership enables clients to do. And that really leads to the next area I wanted to maybe ask both of you about, and that's down the road, 2025 or beyond. And Jag, I think you hit it right on the head. With this information, you can not only make better risk management decisions around your third party, but more importantly, and this is, to me is the key, it's going to drive business for you. It's going to drive business with more efficient and better third parties with enhanced risk management strategies in place. But do you see that as really where all this is going? It's actually going to make businesses more efficient and hopefully at the end of the day, increase profitability and ROI? Certainly, Tom. So, you know, very tactically in many countries, especially the UK, and if you're trying to get a contract with a larger company or with the government, almost a third of the questionnaire is about your social impact. So it's not even too far out in the future. Today, 
companies trying to get such contracts are absolutely required to mitigate not only your sort of legally bound the compliance risk, but also, you know, have a like a strong ESG profile. And the only way you can have a strong ESG profile is if you also measure the ESG profile of your third parties. Tom, 70% of your carbon footprint actually depends on your supply chain. So that's the only way you're going to be able to present yourself well today. Now, going forward with some of the regulations that Daniel talked about in Europe, with some of the investor pressures that we're seeing in the US and Europe, this is going to become a much bigger deal. So, Tom, I really ha- had a very interesting discussion with a compliance professional recently, and I started to talk to them about, you know, the standard stuff, the compliance, FCPA, KYC, et cetera. And he just paused and said, Jag, all we do nowadays is ESG. <laughs> the rest is all in place. My focus is to get this in place next. Yeah, for Ecovadis, because it, you know, it is such an important topic that, and that all businesses participate in it, we can't fall into the trap of good suppliers, bad suppliers, and use this as a stick of compliance to say, well, you're not good enough to do business with us, the end. What we're trying to do with our sustainability r- ratings is provide guidance and a roadmap for every business to be able to become sustainable so that we can use tools like CERTA to raise all boats. There's some supply chains where you literally cannot just rip that supplier out of the supply chain. It it all falls apart when that link comes out. And so what are you going to do if they're not sustainable? The alternative to trying to find a new supplier that's more sustainable is to have better engagement with them, to provide them with the tools and the guidance that they need to improve. And as a planet right now, you know, the elephant in the room is that we actually need this to survive. We need that 70% to do a heck of a lot better than it's doing today if we have any chance of reducing potential impact that we're going to have on this planet through carbon emissions. Daniel, I recently interviewed the investment advisor for him one of the largest institutional investors in America. And we got to the topic of what do you do with a third party? What do you do? Well, from his perspective in investment, do you disengage? Do you sell your interest? And he said, absolutely not. You engage, you engage, you engage. If they're dark brown, you can move them to light brown. They're light brown, you move them to light green. But it's all a process. And what you've just articulated, I think, is a brilliant way to think about that from a different perspective. So I rarely feel hopeful at the end of a podcast, but I must say you gentlemen have really given me uh, not simply a lot to think about, but uh, really hope in how we can use this to engage and to move the needle in in ways that uh, perhaps we would have just disengaged before. Unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode, but I did want to ask both of you all if our listeners wanted more information on JAG, on yourself, on CERTA, or any of the topics you touched on, where could they go? For me, the website is getserta.com. That's the word get, C-E-R-T-A dot com. And to reach me, it's jag, like the car Jaguar. So jag at getserta.com. Thank you again, Tom, for inviting me. For Ecovadis, it's ecovadis.com. That's E-C-O-V-A-D-I-S dot com. And If I could do one little plug, we have our annual conference coming up on March 14, 15 called Sustain 2022. And our keynote speaker will be Paul Polman, a former CEO of Unilever. And if you're looking for inspiration, look no further. So thank you so much for your time. Gentlemen, I wanted to thank you both for taking the time to visit with me. This has really been a great episode. And frankly, I look forward to continuing this conversation. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Tom. Great meeting you.